The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, Chapter 1, starting with page 15. I trusted my father, but as I got older, I began to wonder how his explanation accounted for Chuck Norris, Terminator, and Rambo, who arrived at the Wimbay Trading Center one summer and caused all kinds of ruckus. These men appeared in action movies that played in the local video show, which was really just a mud hut with benches, a television, and a VCR. At night, wonderful and mysterious things happened there, but since I wasn't allowed out after dark, I never saw any of them. Instead, I had to hear stories the next morning from friends whose parents weren't so strict. Last night I watched the best of all movies, said my friend Peter. Rambo jumped from the top of the mountain and was still firing his gun. When he landed at the bottom, everyone in front of him died and the entire mountain exploded. He pretended to clutch a machine gun and fire in all directions. When will they start showing these films during the day, I said. I never get to see anything. That night, the Terminator came to the video show. It was simply shocking. When Peter found me the next morning, he was still in a state. William, I just don't understand this movie. This man was shot left, right, and center, and yet he still managed to live. I'm telling you, this Terminator must be the greatest wizard ever. It sounded fantastic. Do you think the Americans have such magic? I asked. I don't believe it. This is what I saw, Peter said. I'm telling you, it's true. Although years would pass before I saw any of these films, they began influencing our games at home. One was a shooting game that I played with my cousin, Jeffrey, using toy guns we made from a mopomoni bush. Finding a straight branch, we removed its core, like taking out the insides of a ballpoint pen, and used it as a ramrod to fire paper spitballs. I was the captain of one team, and Jeffrey was the captain of the other. Along with our cousins, we formed squads and hunted one another between the houses in our village. You go left and I'll go right, I instructed my soldiers one afternoon, then crawled on hands and knees through the red dirt. My poor mother was constantly scrubbing our clothes. Right away, I spotted Jeffrey's trousers from around the corner of the house. Slowly, without spooking the chickens, I snuck up behind for an easy ambush. Tonga, I shouted, then jammed the ramrod, sending a shower of slime into his face. He clutched his heart and fell to the ground. Eh, hey, mayoine, he gasped. You got me. We were a solid gang of three, me, Jeffrey, and our friend Gilbert. Gilbert's father was the chief of our whole Wimbe district, a man whom everyone called Chief Wimbe, even though his real name was Albert. When Jeffrey and I got bored with playing our games in the courtyard, we often headed to Gilbert's. Let's see how many chickens we can count, I said, taking off down the path. Going over to Gilbert's house was always fun, since the chief's work was never finished. As usual, we found a long line of truck drivers, farmers, traders, and market women, all waiting to voice their concerns. As we suspected, many of them carried a chicken under their arm, a gift for their chief. I counted ten. Jeffrey whispered. Yeah, I said, must be lots of problems today. The chief's messenger and bodyguard, Mr. Nwangata, stood at the door in his short pants and army boots, dressed as a police officer. It was Mr. Nwangata's job to protect the chief and filter out all of his visitors. He was also the chicken collector. Come, come, he said, and motioned us inside. The chief sat on the sofa in the living room, dressed in a crisp shirt and nice trousers. Chiefs usually dress like business people, never in feathers and animal skins. That's in the movies. Another thing about Chief Wimbe was that he loved his cat, which was black and white but had no name. In Malawi, only dogs are given names. I don't know why. We found Gilbert in his room, singing to the radio. Gilbert had this most beautiful voice and dreamed of becoming a famous singer. My voice sounded like one of the guinea fowl that screeched in our trees as it pooped, but I never let that stop me from singing. Gilbert, bow, bow, sharp, sharp. That was our slang we used every time we saw one another. The word bow was short for bonjour, started by some chaps who were learning French in school and wanted to show off. It means hello in that language. I don't know where sharp came from, but it was like saying, are you cool? If we were feeling really good, we went a bit further. Sure? 
Sure. Fit? Fit? Eh. Hey. Let's go to the training center, I said. I bet there's a mountain of treasure outside Ofesi. Ofesi Boozing Center was the local bar in Wimbe. Its most popular drink was Shake Shake, a kind of beer made from corn that was sold in cardboard cartons. <clears throat> I wasn't allowed inside Ofesi, but I'm guessing they didn't have a garbage can because every night the men tossed their empty cartons into the road. Gilbert, Jeffrey, and I liked to collect them. After we washed the cartons out with water, they made the perfect toy trucks. Even though we lived in a small village in Africa, we did many of the same things kids do all over the world. We just used different materials. After talking with friends I met in America, I know this is true, children everywhere have similar ways of playing with one another. And if you look at it this way, the world is in such a big place. My friends and I loved trucks. It didn't matter what kind. We loved the four-ton dump trucks that rumbled out of the big farms, kicking up dust. We loved the small pickups that took passengers from Wimbe to Kasungu, the nearest city. We loved them all. And each week, we'd compete to see who could build the best one. I know that in America, you can buy toy trucks already assembled in a store. In Malawi, we built ours from shake-shake cartons and pieces of wire. To us, they were just as beautiful. The axles were sections of wire we bought by picking mangoes. And for the wheels, we used bottle caps. Even better were the plastic caps from our mother's containers of cooking oil, which lasted much longer. And if we took our father's razor blades, we could cut designs in the wheels to give each truck its own unique treading. That way, the tracks in the dirt told us if the truck belonged to Kamkwamba Toyota, for instance, or to Gilbert Company, LTD. We also built our monster wagons called Chigiriri that looked like American go-karts. We made the frames from thick tree branches, careful to find ones with giant knots or a fork that could be used as a seat. We then dug up large tuber roots called kambu that looked like mutant sweet potatoes and shaped them into wheels. The axles were poles carved from a blue gum tree. After everything was assembled, we tied it all together with vines and hoped it didn't fall apart. To make the car move, one person pulled with a long rope while the driver steered with his feet. With two cars side by side, we held derbies through the trading center. Let's race, for sure. Last one to reach the barber shop will go blind. Go! After the race, if we had some money in our pockets, we'd stop by Mr. Banda's shop for a cold bottle of Fanta and some dandy sweets. Mr. Banda read the, ran the Malawian version of a convenience store. On his shelves were packages of margarine and powdered milk, since most people didn't have refrigerators at home to keep the milk cold. He also sold aspirin, cough, drop, cough drops, lotions, bars of life buoy soap, and on the very bottom shelf, Drew's liver salts. I have no idea what liver salts were used for, but I'm certain they tasted rotten. Whenever we entered, Mr. Banda greeted us in our usual Malawian custom. Muli Bwanji, he said. How are you? Nidira Bwino, Kaya Inu, we answered. I'm fine. How about you? Nidiri Bwino, Zikomo. I'm fine. Thanks for asking. After that, it was more of the same stuff. You boys keeping out of trouble? Yeah. Helping your mother and father at home? Yeah. We'll give them my greetings, for sure. If we were really hungry, we combined our money and headed to the Kayenya stand, which was like a Malawian fast food restaurant. It was really just a vat of boiling grease over a fire, but the fried goat meat and potatoes they served were heavenly. The man tending the fire would grunt and say, how much? And we would answer five kwacha, or however much money we had. Five kwacha was less than one American dollar. The man then turned around and cut a few chunks of meat from the goat hanging from a rail. He dropped the meat into the boiling oil, followed by a handful of sliced potatoes. When everything floated to the top, he served it on a wooden counter, along with a pile of salt for dipping. Your mother is a good cook, Gilbert told me once, but not as good as this. Yeah. My parents wanted me home before dark, but that was my favorite time of day anyway. It was when my father and Uncle John, Jeffrey's father, finished their work in the maize fields and came home for supper. In the kitchen, my older sister Annie helped my mother prepare the food. 
Since we had no electricity, we still cooked everything over a fire. As Annie fed sticks into the flames, my mother stirred a pot of something delicious, letting the smells escape into the courtyard. Since I was a growing boy, it was hard for me to wait, even if I'd just eaten Kayenya in the trading center. With my stomach growling, I'd stand in the doorway begging. Just a few more minutes, my mother would say. By the time you wash your hands and face, it will be ready. Usually before supper, my cousins gathered in the courtyard and played soccer. Since we had no money for a real ball, we made our own using plastic shopping bags that we called jumbos, wadded together and tied with rope. They didn't have the same kind of bounce as a real soccer ball, but they still allowed us to play. All across Africa, children used the same jumbo balls. If it was the rainy season, when the mangoes were ripe, we filled our pails from the neighbor's trees and ate them for dessert. We bit into the juicy fruit and let the sweet syrup run down our fingers. If there wasn't any moonlight for playing soccer, my father gathered all the children, cousins and all, in the living room, lit a kerosene lamp, and told us folk tales. Be still and hush up, he would say. Now, have I told you the story about the leopard and the lion? Tell it again, Papa. Sometimes I forgot, father forgot the stories, and made up new ones as he went along, creating new characters and outrageous endings. And while we loved hearing these tales, the truth was that real life was sometimes difficult to distinguish from fantasy. During the times of year when we planted and harvested our maize, two jobs that required lots of work, my father and Uncle John hired someone to help them. The most famous of these workers was Mr. Fury, a man of incredible power. In fact, whenever John and my father needed to clear a new field for planting, they didn't even bother with tractors. Instead, they sent Fury, who yanked entire trees out of the ground as if they were weeds. Everyone knew that Fury's secret was Mangolomera, a kind of magic that delivered superhuman strength. Only the strongest wizards in Malawi could give you this potion, which came in a paste made from the bones of leopards and lions. To get the strength, the wizard cut your skin with special razor blades and rubbed the medicine into your blood. Once part of you, it never left. In fact, the magic only became stronger with time. Only the toughest men like Fury could live with it inside of them. Fury was so strong that no person or animal could beat him. Once, while working in the fields, a deadly black mamba slithered over his foot and prepared to strike. But Fury wasn't afraid. He reached down and whipped the mamba with a blade of grass, leaving it paralyzed. Then he grabbed it by the head and tossed it all the way to Mozambique. People said he carried another mamba in his pocket for good luck, and that snake was too afraid to bite him. By the time I was eight or nine years old, the thought of Mangolomera seemed more and more attractive. You see, I was very small, and this led to constant trouble with bullies at school. The worst was named Lembikani, who was tall and muscular, and had older brothers at home, which made him even more ruthless. For some reason, Limbikani liked to pick on me and Gilbert. One day on our way to school, he waited for us on the road and jumped out from a grove of trees. Oh, look, it's William and his friend, Little Chief Wimbe. Leave us alone, I shouted, but my voice cracked and gave me away. Limbikani put his chest in Gilbert's face. Where's the big chief monkey boy? Looks like he's not here to protect you. He grabbed the backs of our shirts and dangled us in the air like two sad puppies. Then he stole our lunch. This happened again and again. Not only did my size leave me defenseless against bullies, it also haunted me on the soccer field. I loved soccer more than anything, and each week I'd glue myself to Radio 1 for Malawi's Super League action. My favorite team was the Nomads, whose star player was Bob the Savior Mpindijaria. The Savior got his nickname one Christmas Eve when he saved us from defeat against Big Bullets and I can't tell you how much I hated big bullets. Despite my size, I longed to be a player as worthy as my heroes. Whenever all of us boys gathered for practice and drills, I was some kind of star in my own mind. Oh, how I would shine, zigzagging between defenders and firing the ball at missile speed. Then one day I was displaying my various skills when Jeffrey and some others called out to me, hey, Kaira, give us the ball. Kaira, as in, Peter Kaira. Despite my love for the nomads, my greatest hero in all the universe was indeed 
Peter Kajira, the best player for the Flames, our national team, and to me, a man even greater than the president. To be called Kajira was no small thing. I couldn't stop smiling. Soon everyone on the practice pitch was calling me Kajira. Even when I went to the trading center, I was greeted with shouts and praise. Hey, Kajira, I heard you play like a lion. But when it was time to pick the teams for competition, the captain somehow skipped over me. Thinking this was a serious mistake on their part, I pointed it out, only to be told to sit on the bench. How could this be? Well, I thought, the captains are clever fellows. Perhaps they're saving me from injury, keeping me as a secret weapon for the finals. This made me feel even more special. But while I sat on the sidelines, the other players ran past me and yelled, Keep the bench warm, Kaira, or Kaira, we'll be needing you soon, as the bolera. A bolela was a ball fetcher. That's when I realized it had all been a joke. I was called Kaira not because of my ferocious skills, but because I was a lousy player. The following summer, I decided to do something about it. <laughs> Mr. Fury had a nephew named Shabani, who was always bragging about being a real Singanga, who possessed Mangalomera. Gilbert and I suspected he was full of hot air, but we were never sure. Shabani was like a small me, yet he boasted like a man three times his size. This made us wonder. Shabani didn't go to school, but worked all day in the fields with his uncle. So he was usually there when I returned home in the afternoons, complaining about bullies or sitting on the bench. One day, after hearing another one of my pathetic stories, he pulled me aside. Every day you're moaning about these boys, and I'm tired of hearing it, he said. I can give you Mango Lamera. You can become the strongest guy in school. All of the bullies will fear you. Of course, having superpowers was a lifelong dream. On the soccer field, I could fly like a leopard with legs like rocket launchers. Pow! Reacting to my Mango Lamera, bullies at school would wet their trousers with fright. My father had always warned me about playing with magic. But now, with Shabani standing there, smiling like a mongoose, I couldn't resist. We'll do it in the blue gum forest, he said. <clears throat> okay, I blurted. I'll take it. We'll do it in the blue gum forest, he said. Meet me there in one hour and bring 20 tambala. A tambala was like a penny in our Malawian money. An hour later, I arrived in the forest and waited in the shadows for Shabani, my heart beating fast. Shabani then appeared through the trees, carrying a black bag that contained something heavy. Are you ready? He asked. Yeah, I'm ready. Then sit down. We took a seat on the soft red dirt and he opened his bag of wonders. From inside, he pulled out a tiny matchbox. In here are the blackened bones of lions and leopards, along with other roots and herbs. He fished out another package filled with strange dust, which he mixed with the ashes. These other materials are extremely rare, found only on the bottom of the ocean. So how did you get them? I asked. Look, boy, he snapped. I'm not some ordinary person. I got them from the bottom of the ocean. I stayed down there for three whole days. If I wanted to, I could turn every person in your stupid village into an ant. So don't play with me, Bombo. If you want this kind of power, it will cost you lots of money. What I'm giving you is only a small taste. I didn't even see him pull out his magic razor. Before I knew it, he grabbed my hand and cut into my knuckles. Ah! I screamed. Be still and don't cry, he said. If you cry, it won't work. I'm not crying. My knuckles brightened with blood. For each one, Shabani pinched a little powder and rubbed it into the cuts. The medicine stung like a hundred bees. Once he finished both hands, I exhaled with relief. See, I didn't cry, I said, panting. I'd been holding my breath. Do you think it will work? Oh yeah, it will work. When, I asked, when will I have my power? He thought for a few seconds and said, give it three days to work its way through your veins. Once it's complete, you'll feel it. Three days. Yeah, and whatever you do, don't eat okra and stay away from sweet potato leaves. I'll remember. And lastly, he added, tell no one. I walked out of the forest, rubbing my mangled knuckles. Although they hurt like mad, I hate to admit, I had to admit they looked pretty tough. That evening, I hid in my room and spoke to no one. Three days was a long time to wait, but it worked with my plan. It was the beginning of the summer holiday. 
and the following morning I left to visit my grandparents, who lived a few hours away in the town of Doha. It was the perfect place to receive my powers before coming home a hero. Well, three days crept by so slowly I thought I would die from boredom. Worse, my grandmother kept putting me to work cleaning the yard and chicken pens and scrubbing her kitchen floor, which left my arms tired and rubbery. Oh, I wondered, when will I become strong? But on the fourth day, I awoke and instantly felt different. My arms were heavy as if laden with stones. I flexed my muscles and they felt as firm as tree trunks. My hands, squeezed into fists, were as solid as two bricks. Heading outside, I took off running down the dirt road to test my speed. Sure enough, I felt the wind in my face like never before. That afternoon, my Uncle Mada invited me to watch a soccer game at the town field. Perfect, I thought. Here I can test my powers. Like always, the place was packed with people. But I had no interest in the game. Instead, I scanned the crowd looking for the biggest boy. When I found him, around my age, standing at the far corner of the field, I walked over and stomped on his bare foot. He let out a cry. Excuse me, he said, hopping up and down. You just stepped on my toes. I stared at him, saying nothing. I said, you stepped on my toes. It hurt. So what, I said. Well, it's rude, don't you think? Then why don't you do something about it? He looked confused. What do you mean? You heard me. Do something, Cape. Cape is a drooling idiot. Well, in that case, he said, I'm going to beat you. That's it. That's what I was hoping you would say. We began dancing around in circles and I wasted no time. I unleashed a flurry of punches that were so fast and terrifying that my arms blurred before my eyes. I gave him lefts and rights and a few uppercuts for good measure. My iron fists moved so furiously that I didn't even feel them smashing his face. After a while, though, I began to feel sorry for the guy, so I backed away and took a breath. But to my surprise, the boy was still standing. Worse, he was laughing at me. Before I could unleash another deadly round, I felt a terrible pain in my eye. Then another and another. Soon I was lying on the ground while his fists pounded my back and stomach. By the time my uncle raced over and rescued me, I was crying and covered with dust. What are you doing, William? He shouted. You know better than to fight. That boy is twice your size. I was so embarrassed that I ran back to my grandparents' house and didn't come outside for the rest of the weekend. Once I got home, I found Shabani and confronted him. Your magic doesn't work. You promised me power, but I was beaten in Dawa. Of course it works, he said, then thought for a second. Listen, did you take a bath the day I gave it to you? Yes. Well, that's why. My medicine doesn't allow you to bathe. You never said that. Of course I did. But, as you can see, I was clearly cheated. My first and only experience with magic left me with sore hands, a throbbing eye, and a healthy dose of skepticism. Gradually, the witches and wizards didn't seem as frightening or powerful, and I began to look at the world in a different way. I saw it as one explained by fact and reason rather than mystery and hocus pocus. But in this world, there still existed the same set of sorrows.